video stream of the audience will be kept off. Uh, feel free to type in your questions either in the comment box or the question box at the center bottom of your screen. Also, could you please add to the text of your question which of the panelists you are uh, referring to? That makes it uh, easier for us. And also, could you please specify if you want us to read out or uh, whether you want to speak? That also makes things uh, easier for us to navigate. Right, having said that, so this panel would interrogate a plethora of practices that range from the domain of agro-military productions to violent ontologies, to cosmopolitan centers of culture, and finally to queer subjective formations within different spatiotemporal uh, settings in South Asia. In this process, these papers would seek to reimagine the archival space uh, beyond the dominant trope of its uh, sovereign presence and rather seek to problematize the archive as a continuous process in dialogue with a range of critical uh, practices that are embedded within and beyond the archive. This panel also makes an effort to chart out alternative provenances from where it can critique the very canonicity of the loaded conceptual category of sovereignty as well. To chair this fascinating panel, we have with us today Professor Anshu Malhotra. Thank you, Professor Malhotra, for joining us at the super early hour from California, I guess. Uh, Professor Malhotra is a Kundan Kaur Kapani Chair in Sikh and Punjab Studies and Professor uh, in the Department of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She writes on histories of Punjab, focusing on questions of gender, culture, and religious identities. She's the author of Peer and Gulab Dasis, uh, gender, Sect, and Society in Punjab, published by Oxford University Press in 2017, and Gender, Caste, and Religious Identities, Restructuring Class in Colonial Punjab. She has co-edited Punjab Reconsidered History, Culture, and Practice, Speaking of the Self, Gender, Performance, and Autobiography in South Asia, and Text and Tradition in Early Modern North India. She has published in journals like Modern Asian Studies, Indian Social and Economic History Review, Journal of Women's History, Journal of Punjab Studies, Sikh Formations, amongst others. Thank you for joining us, Professor Malhotra. Our discussant for the panel is Dr. Julian Strube. He's an assistant professor in religious studies at the University of Vienna. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Julian again after he joined us for yesterday's wonderful roundtable. So Julian in his work focuses on the relationship between religion and politics since the 19th century from a global history perspective. In his earlier work, he investigated radical politics and religious reform movements in the context of European socialism, national socialism, and esotericism. Since his postdoc research, he examines these and related subjects within the context of global religious history, having extended his focus to North America and Bengal. Have, he specifically concentrates on how the relationship between religion, science, and politics has been negotiated amongst Bengali intellectuals in exchange with non-Indian interlocutors, notably with regard to notions such as reform, tradition, revival, or modernity. Um, each panelist will speak for 10 minutes, at best 12 minutes. I would really request everyone to keep their presentation so that we have time for a discussion. And uh, the presentations will be followed by comments from Julian, from Professor Malhotra, and then we can open it up for, uh, from, for comments from the uh, audience. Uh, all yours, Professor Malhotra. Uh, thank you, Shivatri. So thank you very much for inviting me to chair this uh, you know, wonderful session on you know, intellectual histories and sovereignties and the making of the archive. I have no clue why you've chosen a Punjabi historian to <laughs> chair a session where most of the presentations seem to come from Bengal, but I'm very happy to do it nevertheless. Thank you so much for inviting me. So uh, let me introduce Aisarya Dathroy very quickly. I'm sorry, that's the way I pronounce it. I cannot get the Bengali accent, so I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, Aitzarya is currently pursuing her PhD from the Center for Women's Studies, University of Hyderabad. Her doctoral work focuses on the political participation and visibility of trans persons in the queer movement in West Bengal. Her areas of interest include gender and sexuality studies, queer theory. She has completed her graduation from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, and has obtained her master's degree from University of Hyderabad. She has also completed her MPhil from the University of Hyderabad. Parts of her doctoral work have been presented at IIT Guwahati Graduate Research Meet in 2019. She has also spoken at the Samagam Conference 2019 uh, and has made you know, many, many other presentations on the questions of fluidities of gender and sexual expressions and bringing in the concept of trans standpoints theories 
Uh, her paper titled Quest for a Livable Life, Legal Identity and Queer Disconnect has been presented at the Indian Association for Women's Studies conference um, in January 2020. So thank you very much, Aisarya, for joining us. Um, can I invite you to please make your presentation? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Malotu. I hope I am audible. Uh, so uh, the title of my uh, presentation is a Sanctuary of Anatomy, Rereading Binaries of Queer Lives in the Archives. Uh, so a quick clarification about the words queer and trans that I'm going to be using in this presentation. I use queer as a rubric comprising of identities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, hijra, kothi, and other gender fluid and gender non-binary identities, acknowledging that each of these identities are spectrums in themselves, in turn fractured by other axes, such as caste, class, race, disability, religion, ethnicity, age, and so on. I do not intend to define any of these identities, and I am aware of the historical incongruities that such a usage might entail. Along similar lines, I do not think of trans to be a monolithic homogeneous category, and it just does not comprise of trans masculine and trans feminine identities, but all of these identities within trans and the larger queer umbrella are internally fragmented and intersected along the lines of caste, class, disability, religion, age, ethnicity, language, and so on. At the same time, it must be acknowledged that there might be a hegemonic linguistic imposition with the terms queer and trans for gender fluid and gender non-binary identities that do not fit into the alphabet soup of the English lexicon. As identities are not written on stone, there are fluidities and variations across geographical and cultural spaces as well. Having said that, I would now like to draw your attention to two moments in contemporary legal discourse with regard to trans persons gaining legal recognition in India. The first is the National Legal Services Authority versus the Union of India Judgment of 2014, hereafter referred to as the Lalsa verdict. And the second is the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act, which was passed in 2020, but responses against which have been coming from trans and intersex persons since 2016, when the first draft was drawn, till about 2019, when the final draft was finalized. There have been other legislations concerned with trans persons and their rights, but my focus in this paper is on these two judgments and the consequent responses they generated. In this short span, therefore, I would make an attempt to understand the sovereign trans subjects that the state envisions to produce through these two judgments and the kinds of criticisms they engendered by trans gender fluid and intersex persons, which have been diametrically opposed to the state's perceived understandings of controllable and docile trans subjects. The right to self-perceived gender identity has been the quintessential locus around which trans persons in India have woven their struggles for legal recognition, and the Nalsa verdict keeps a fairly wide definition of who may fall under the purview of the category of transgender. I quote, transgender is generally described as an umbrella term for persons whose gender identity, gender expression, or behavior does not conform to their biological sex." Unquote. The verdict proceeds to recognize transgender persons as third gender in all official documents granting them fundamental rights under the Indian constitution and provided for reservations in jobs and educational institutions. Although hailed to be a landmark judgment, the Nalsa, however, uses words such as eunuchs to refer to hijra persons a word that has been rejected by trans persons across the country for its offensive and criminalizing connotations. It also puts emphasis on an unnecessary biological determinism with regard to hijras and their supposed, within quotes, lack of either male or female reproductive organs. Furthermore, in the conflation of identities such as transgender, hijra, third gender, etc., the verdict completely overlooks female to male transmasculine identities as aptly pointed out by G. Iman Semalar, a trans activist who identifies as trans man, while charting out the implications of the Nalsa body. Now, coming to the Trans Act, this act has received numerous criticisms from trans and intersex persons across the country for its deeply repugnant view of transgender identities that it espouses. A legislation meant for the welfare of the trans communities, this act makes it mandatory for trans persons to register themselves with the government by submitting documentary evidences of having undergone gender reassignment surgeries 
in order to be officially recognized as transgender in the first place. Although in an entirely different socio-cultural context, this provision of registration somehow pushes us to consider the criminalization of gender fluid identities during colonial rule as eunuchs and their consequent registration with the British government under the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871. Uh, coming back to the Trans Act, it makes it compulsory for trans identified children to live with their natal families, which is an utter disregard for the Hijra kinship system. Although this system too has its own issues of hierarchies within the Guru Chela binary, but the Hijra families do provide immense support to trans identified children most of whom face massive physical, emotional, and psychological violence from their natal families and are thus forced to leave their homes. The act also allows for lesser, lesser punishment for uh, rapes committed against trans persons with imprisonment from six months to two years. Punishment for rapes committed against cisgender women is however a life imprisonment, which further implies that the state sees the bodies of trans persons as more readily dispensable. The processes of enumeration through which the state endeavors to create legible and submissive subjects have failed to encompass the complexities surrounding lived experiences of marginalized identities. My aim in this paper is not to look at the grand events of subversion as conventional history prompts us to consider. Rather, I want to understand the minutiae of everyday living that the state perceives to be threatening to the, ex to the extension of its sovereign control. In the context of the patriarchal heteronormative ideals that states and governments have imbibed through laws and judgments, there is a constant attempt to create subjects who comply to such ideals, failing which the subjects will be rendered unintelligible and illegitimate, and hence unarchived. The responses against the aforementioned legislations have been archived, however, at various websites such as Bartha Trust, Sampurna India, Urinam, Feminism in India, Roundtable, etc. Drawing upon intimate lived experiences, these responses have been from left-leaning and Ambedkarite queer and trans-identified individuals such as Rachana Mudra Boina, G. Iman Semelar, Vaijayanti Vasanta Mogni, Pawan Dhal, to name a few. Responses have also been documented that have come from communities such as Telangana Hijra Intersex Transgender Samiti and the Intersex Community of India. <clears throat> Press meets held at several cities subsequently coming out with press releases against the Trans Act have also been documented. As large scale protests had erupted in different parts of the country against the draft bills of the Trans Act, the posters of these protest marches that serve as important political tools to understand dissent have also been archived online, as have been countless media coverages. In the autobiographies of three trans women, A. Revati, Living Smile Vidya, and Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi, we find the complexities of everyday lives contesting rigid gender normative notions that are archived through memories and clipped experiences. This leads me to an understanding of what can then be construed as archives, for a conventional understanding reduces archives to hegemonic spaces through which the state's purpose of creating subjugated citizens becomes fulfilled. The archives of the colonial state along similar lines have sought to codify gender fluid identities such as Khwaja Sarais, Hijras, Zenanas into the singular category of eunuchs by criminalizing their occupations of cross-dressing and performances as scholar Jessica Hinchi has documented as well as prosecuting individuals for homosexuality or sodomy as documented by scholar Anjali Arundhikar. The authoritative language of moral panic and obscenity through the bodies of eunuchs who posed a threat to colonial perceptions of masculinity abound in such archival spaces. However, gender fluid identities have consistently resisted such state sanctioned dominance through the quotidian practices of migration, performance without cross dressing, everyday retelling of their genealogies from the Hindu myths, arms collection, etc., practices that were not criminalized under the colonial law. This made surveillance of colonial authorities over these people remarkably difficult. Everyday practices during colonial rule by gender fluid identities, as well as archives of protests and dissenting voices by gender and sexually marginalized identities in the contemporary times against laws and jurisdictions further complicate our own understanding of archives and the state's sovereign power of constructing governable citizens.
the desire to be governed on their own terms as important stakeholders of legal and juridical mechanisms of transpersons then further underscores the significant confrontations with statist perspectives of dominating compliant subjects. Thank you everyone for listening to me. Thank you very much. Very much, Aisarya, for that presentation. Uh, you know, bringing out complexities of various sorts in the lives of, um, you know, um, queer and trans persons. Um, I now invite Ashish Kumar Dhar to, you know, make his presentation. Uh, Ashish is a PhD research scholar at the Department of History, University of Hyderabad. Uh, his research uh, interest includes regional history, governance, and history of communities. He is presently working on Purnia's uh, community sense of belonging in frontier politics in late 18th and early 19th century India um, under his uh, supervisor. Ashish obtained his graduate degree from the University of Calcutta uh, at Presidency College. Uh, he completed his post-graduation in history from the University of Calcutta. He joined the University of Hyderabad as a PhD research scholar in 2016. Uh, and a part of his research work has been delivered at Shivnadar University. Uh, he is an annual member of the Indian History Congress um, and Pashchim Banga Itihas uh, Sansad. So I invite Ashish to make his presentation. Thank you, Professor Manastra. And also thank you to the organizing committee. Uh, my paper is titled uh, Sovereignty on Trial, Episodes of Violence as Practice in 18th Century Bengal. So, uh, I'm sure about the violence part of it, the subtext of my uh, title. I'm not very uh, sure about the title I choose for the paper. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to state that this is a work in progress and uh, I seek your feedback in all forms. Also, I'd like to ascertain that this is a case study on Punya district in the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, and reading its relation with the frontier district of Murang, which is in Nepal, that in official diagrams formed the largest contiguous unit with Puri. Here, I intend to place these contiguous units as not only geographical components, but extend it to argue that how certain morphemes of engagement, if translated, manifest in violence, affrays, depredations, and providers categories of operation of various social groups. These include the Fakirs, the Sanyasis, the mercenaries, both from the sides of the Bhutiyas and the Gorkhas, the Daroga, the Rahadar, and other such social groups. Other such uh, <coughs> also uh, political, those who held political office. In doing so, we show Purnia, we, we, we look at Purnia, we see how Purnia has been archived <coughs> in its relation with the Moran and the violence that perpetrated, which also were documents of people living in fear and officials who resided there in great anxiety. With how the post of Fajdar had been a significant position of not only power, but maintaining a balanced correspondence with the operatives in the place that Purnia was adjoining Moram. Uh, it has been understood that the Fajdars of Purnia were notable in that they had created an autonomous jurisdiction for themselves. However, the gradual doing away with the post after the company got the Diwani right also posited the challenges of countering a ravaging people. Uh, the archival homogeneity of labels such as decoity, banditry, depredations, and affrays are also motives where the company in due course sought to monopolize violence. However, an unit that was virtually uh, you know, uh, always in a state of entropy and mostly read as being a weaponized society, posited challenges from different authors. During the Sikkim War of 1792, Purnia witnessed refractions of violence and villages like Boakhali witnessed plunder and arson in a battle between the mercenaries of the Bhutias and the Gorkhas. Violent acts, acts as such have been mostly read as inflicting material loss to rural societies. And this we come to come across throughout the historiography of Purnia itself, uh, inflict, which is about violence being, you know, as inflicting material loss to rural societies. Visible, visibly, depictions of extraterrestrial violence rather than reading the affinities of the operatives of such violent acts. 
these acts of violence by groups or by individuals were also fractions of history, for violence is mostly tangible and documented. In doing so, what has mostly been studied, studied as the subsidiary to the nondescript operations of a section uh, where, uh, where some acts are undefinable, you know, so we are not sure what sort of activities they are exactly uh, involved with. In its abstract notions of both space and communities, the district officials' dispatches tend to separate these menial operations like timber cutting and cattle grazing at separate, separate occupational trajectories. However, what I argue here is these forms of liminal trading were also related intimately with the forms of violence taking into account not only the refractions of violence during the 1792 war, as I already mentioned, or the Anglo-Gorkha war of 1815-16, but also the everyday violations of territorial delimitations. Coming back to the everyday violence in Punya and its archival conjecture gives, an, gives us an opportunity to read what Charles Tillis terms as domestic constraint to monopoly of the state. So here are here is a restraining kind of uh, order that is coming from various social groups that we are witnessing here. It creates temporalities of both violence and violent operations, where in two sovereign worlds, one of the operation when, when of the execution of the mercenaries and another is the uh, jurisdictional expedition of the uh, state is being uh, kind of uh, where I argue it's meeting. In some temporal projections, violence by the company troops in expediting control over territories has separate set of sets, movements where a band of fakirs is killed. However, in other sets of projections, violence is territorial and sovereign and violence not necessarily emanating as reaction to certain policies of the state, which is in this case, the East India people. Dequity, banditry have rather been congruous estimates which document expressions of the sovereign concern of a territory. However, an autonomous set of fractions involving nondescript operations of the Goalas, of the mercenaries, and again, I, I, I keep reiterating this fact, and groups of cattle grazing people may be considered prognostic evidence in discrete histories of the place, uh, because there are uh, still these uh, uh, activities which have been very contemporary in nature and which have not been, uh, which the delimitation uh, project of the empire and the post-colonial state have not been able to map out. I would like to argue that while Purnia Morang became contemporaneous projections of violence throughout the 18th century, these were also genuine components of everyday practice of reciprocity in terms of agriculture and again, uh, some abstract activities. While tangible violence emerged as one of the most discursive points in writing histories of such spaces like Purnia as I'm discussing here, loosely defined as frontier, we need to relocate, relocate the activities and operations of various groups to differentiate and distinguish between sets of violence, not only that have occurred as reactions to companies attempt at monopolizing violence, but also violence where groups who knew each other, who were intimate with each other, at, attack each other for material gains. These are to be studied in context of how personal enmity and other equations such as sabotage has also been taken into consideration. I would like to conclude here by saying that while two geographical units mostly understood as frontier must also be studied in how they have been historically operated upon and how violence as a parable, not distinct of other potent activities has emerged as a discursive point. Thank you. Thank you very much Ashesh uh, for that presentation on uh, you know the borderlands of uh, India, the Purnia district, and Morang. Uh, I now invite uh, Sagnik Saha uh, to make his presentation. Sagnik is a doctoral candidate at the Department of History, University of Hyderabad, uh, who does research on geographies of difference in everyday lives in early India, interrogating the Shastric tradition. Uh, he completed his graduation in history from Presidency College, Calcutta and his post-graduation from Jadavpur University. Uh, he wrote his MPhil thesis under the supervision of Professor Aloka Parashar Sen on the Arthashastras and the Jatakas, uh, locating peasant history in early India. 
Uh, he has presented at numerous uh, forums. I will not go into all of them, but you know, uh, he's obviously um, made multiple presentations, including at the Indian History Congress and uh, at the annual conference of Pashtim Banga, Itihas, Sansad, and so on. So at multiple sites, he's also published. Um, yeah, and he has a chapter called Virtual Hegemonies and Literary Imaginings, Readings, the Jatakas Against the Grain, uh, that is forthcoming. So uh, uh, I invite Sadnik to make his presentation. Oh, I think I'm audible. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, so, uh, uh, that is uh, a work in progress and something that is way off from what I work on. Uh, so let's just begin. So <clears throat> the title of my chapter is, uh, sorry, the uh, paper is Travels in Time and Travels of Time. The Sovereign World of Rahal Das Vandabhattai, who is also known as R.C. Banerjee, and he's quite famous for his excavation at Mohenjo-Daro. In the late 19th and early 20th century, colonial Bengal witnessed an intensification of the fervent public discourse on its historical pasts, principally as a nationalist practice and the simultaneous emergence of academic disciplines of history and archeology span governed by the Western rational pedagogy. However, beyond the ignorant native and knowing colonizer binary, archeological enterprise in this period manifested itself as a rich tapestry woven by diverse official, non-official, and individual efforts to retrieve the pasts of Bengal and hence of India. In this complex cosmopolitan intellectual world entangled by networks of diverse institutional spaces of universities, museums, and archives, a sovereign regime of truth had been proclaimed, resulting into an epistemological rupture. Yet, it would be problematic to imagine Bengalis or Indians as passive recipient of modern knowledge under hegemonic shadow of this Eurocentric epistemology infringed in the colonial matrix of power. This essay therefore seeks to trace the ambiguous location of Rakhal Das as an author or translator of his worlds of truth intersected variously by varied ranges of sovereignties and consequently excavates these sovereign territories as polemological spaces contesting grounds of diverse contradictory practices. With the colonial pedagogy consolidation in the later half of 19th century, a new epistemic shift towards universal truth and authenticity had been established, especially at the sites of museum where Rakhal Dash initiated his intellectual venture based on a tyranny of post enlightenment scientific method where the isolated body of a knower engages with the distant material objects through the scientific gaze, a dominant epistemological predisposition for static ocular centric observation. The synchronous sovereign space of enduring Itihas of Purana tradition with different perceptions of time and space, historical memory based on teleological force of destiny, divine intervention, and the balance of karma that was manifested in Vidyalankar's uh, Rajabuli had been readily restrained and abandoned on the question of epistemic credibility, reckoned in unfit for the project of nation making. Under the tutelage of both indigenous Sanskritist Horoposat Shastri and colonial mentor Theodore Bloch, Rakhal Dash mastered both Sanskrit and the craft of history and archaeology at the levels of university and music. And at an early stage, he attained serious proficiency in an arduous craft of decipherment and methodical examination of epigraphic resources. By adopting the Western epigraphic discourse and methods of rigorous cross referencing to parallel source materials, to relevant scholarly authorities, mostly following the styles of authorities like Kilhorn and J.P.H. Fogel. With serious recognition of his scholarly works among the peer scholarly groups, he readily found his way to the dominion of research that he co-shared with both European and Indian scholars. Ostensibly, this truth-seeking dominion treated, it, treated its every citizen equally despite their unequal location in socio-political hierarchy. Engaged in descriptive cataloging of artifacts in various museums, Rakhal Dash, like many of his colleagues, had inculcated an appreciation for the material evidence, owing to their brute intransigent of matter. That elevates them to transparent impartial witness to past, 
In a celebrated debate on the historicity of the Kula Grantal, Rakhal Dash invoked high ideals, uh, quintessential to the historian's craft, espousing the Bengali readers the rewarding elements of the civilized global virtue of scientific history. This unequivocal performance of the authority of the scientific signaled the banishment of dissenting epistemes to the margin by instilling legitimacy to archaeological artifacts through the rhetoric of proof. New archaeologists championed the idea that historians must engage with their sources as an impartial judge, emphasizing on common proof to their honest submission to truth beyond their own prejudice. Indulgence in fanciful imagination that is Kalpana Lulupata in hearsay, Janasruti, and outlandish legends, Alukik Kahini, had been considered as a serious threat in pursuit of truth. Following Ginsburg, then it can be assumed that the trope of judging based on proof or truth evoked positivistic implications, a predisposition to simplify the complex relations between the evidence and reality. A positivistic analysis primarily scrutinizes the authenticity of the source materials that are considered as a transparent media, providing the scholars direct access to reality. Curiously, Moitre find the compassion uh, or shawhidayata towards downtrodden rural subjects so as an uh, important attribute of a true researcher, as mostly they are for the first witness to unearthing the, of the artifact, whether Rakhal does share the same sen sentiment stay if we book. Uh, conforming to linear progression of undulating historical time, a unitary empirical historical methodology was promoted where rigorous critical scrutiny of the sources would require traveling to the place, places in a quest to and examining of the sources in person. The romantic archive of the Dinas Chandra Shane and company that accommodated, accommodated this outcast you know, excess of collective memory as impressions of past was regarded as impediment to the accomplishment of the sovereign world of empirical truth. This elucidates their significant lack of deliberation with literary sources, especially with the epics and Purans where, uh, where the early historical tradition remained embedded, except for somewhat externalized tradition of historical chronicles like Raj Parikh. Yet the mark of perfect research remained elusive as there was always a chance for error and misrepresentation uh, from which even Rakhal Dutch and his mentors failed to escape. However, this spontaneous compliance to epistemic authority to, of Eurocentric knowledge failed to produce any consensus regarding the reading of the sources and the verdicts of the historical events. Responding to the appeal of Bonkin Chandra to write their own history, Rakhal Dutch had translated the universal empirical epistemology into the domain of vernacular, contaminated with a deep sense of self-respect for fashioning a site of contestation, equal in terms of epistemic rigor and validity against the hegemonic narratives of the Indian past by, authored by the colonial authorities like mostly Vincent Smith. With the contemporary upsurge of, of the discoveries of various inscriptional and numismatic artifacts and art objects in parts of Bengal and India, Rakhal Dash along with other Bengali group of scholars started creating a parallel indigenous archive as a custodian of nation's past by collecting the artifacts and deciphering inscriptions with critical precision and documenting them with minute detail. Inverting the stigma of ignorance long associated with the natives who are incompetent to acquire the craft of history, he recommended a cautious approach towards the inferences of colonial scholars before taking them into consideration owing to their ridiculous efforts. Driven by strong political will conditioned by the existing power relations, Rakhal Dash found his calling of history in being an educator, disseminating true knowledge of the past in the vernacular domain. Uh, the tactical maneuver uh, against this against the coloniality helped him to be one of the principal figures in the collective for the reclamation of Bengal's own past for the parallel indigenous organizations, albeit their glaring, glaring epistemological difference. Paradoxically, then, empirical positivistic research or Onu Shandhan as a potent dispassionate quest for ultimate truth based on coherent evidential reasoning regarded as a morally charged act in itself as the vice of indifference to ultimate historical truth would stultify the process of realizing a nation state. With the lack of historical literary sources and only few substantial material sources that were discovered either too, Rakhaldash lamented the history of, history of Bengal only could retain skeletal form 
compared to the complete body of history, Shampuna Boyo Vitihash of the European states. Yet it appears plausible to extract records of social life of the contemporary Bengal from the existing epigraphic materials. If only the scholars had not been susceptible to the desire of emulation of the contemporary European model of political history, centering primarily on the royalty and the state, excavating the icons of the nation state. Treading into the world of novel, a terrain of dialogic prose with aesthetic possibilities at the margin of the regime of truth, Rahal Dash made an endeavor to invoke a glorious imagery of ancient Bengal to the Bengali public, compensating this deficiency of it. Blurring the virtual boundaries of these spaces in the process, Rakhal Dash crossed and dwelled in all the world simultaneously with an inherent anxiety of losing his vision of sovereignty. In a nodal point of historical novels, with, his, with its own dangerous propensity, he persistently, persistently de defined the boundaries between the domain of factual history and fiction. However, for him, it remained equally important to generate a parable of power for prefiguring a possible political future by translating the prevalent discourse of sovereignty into the past, even at the risk of being blatantly anachronistic. In his Dharmapal, Rakhal Dash had hastily enumerated the historical characters and events only to indicate similarities between the events of unification under the monarchical rule of Mikado after the willing submission of independence by the Damio of feudal lord in the mid 19th century Japan with the event elect of elective accession of Gopala to the throne after the identical submission by the Samantas in the 18th century Bengal. Interestingly, Rakhal Das, the sentinel of its evidential truth, managed to convey his free outlook uh, about the con you know, contradictory statement of present election, present in the hard evidence that Stalin put plate inscription in juxtaposition to his idea of landlord election as impossibility. While this episode was considered as the most important event in the history of Bengalis, epitomizing the rise of political subjects, Proja Shokti, Rakhal Dash, with his pragmatic political sense, restored the power in the hands of the elite landlords, probably echoing a sentiment of his contemporary public sphere with their pristine admiration for Japanese nationalism. It is only at this frontier domain of novel, what he calls Akhaika, that he could unshackle the from chains of the positivistic approach, unbridling his nationalist political vision, imagining an ancient Bengal with flesh and blood in his own emotive way, imbued in Oitihashik Rosh. Invoking a disquieting image of the lawless anarchy, or a joke by Max uh, at the outset and ensuing the, the style of Bonkim and advent of fictive ascetic, Bishanondo, uh, embodying spiritual masculinity and polit or political pragmatism, who became instrumental to process of unification, instilling a deep sense of solidarity among the contending small kings. Rakhal Dash educated the readers for similar necessary sacrifice or submission for the higher collective goal that is nation state. The celebrated account of coronation of Gopal as Maharaja Dhiraj with all the small, you know, all the kings and subjects present under the heading of foundation of empire, Shamrajya Pratishtha, can be situated in a stark contrast to the dark image of lawlessness. Dharmapal, who would be ruler of the northern India and united it under, you know, with cultural Aryanness as the pride of Arya Bhatti, Arja Bhatti Gaurav, incarnated a popular sovereignty by virtue of succession. Yet, in seeking transcendental sovereignty, this protagonist, uh, for this for his protagonist, Rakhal Dash shifted, you know, slithered into the abandoned domain of unseen, predestined, and supernatural forces of change, only to enunciate the universal precondition for selfless, disinterested sovereign, an act of dedicated, dedicating life for the welfare of all beings. Shorbo, Jivo Hitartha. However, after Niharanjan Rai's insightful critic, it can be said that even in the process of popular alternative archive, infusing public imagination with a sense of embedded solidarity, much like his contemporary Bhadralok society, the historical agency was restricted to the Brahminical domain of cultural Arya and to the statesmen themselves, while the subjects remain mere elated spectators hailing the king as the history unfolded in front of them by heroic statesmen. Beyond the Puranic and Brahminical, Puranic, Brahminical and Buddhist fold, the humble ignorance, nirbodh, lower castes and classes, 
জনসাধারণ রিমাইন্ড অবস্কিওর্ড অ্যান্ড আনআর্কাইভ ইন টু দ্য রিলিফ অফ দ্য অফ দিস স্কিম অফ হিস্ট্রি প্রেডিক্টেবলি ভার্চুয়াস ওমেন হস্টেজেস টু দ্য অফ দ্য ন্যাশনাল লিস্ট ডিসকোর্স অফ ভেরিলিটি were sacrificed for the foundation and welfare of the masculine space of the nation state nationalist historian rahul dash remained an ardent devotee to his truth his enthusiasm enthusiastic submission uh, to the hegemonic universal knowledge transmuted into an imagining of homogenized regime of cultural political bangla that must as a necessary sacrifice overcome the plural social world of bangali a space of unruly heterogeneous practices centering around multiple world views and their allied epistemic roots therefore the foundation of that bangla must quint essentially be constructed with neutral as well as moral roots as citizens of the both worlds he remained prepared to dedicate himself for the larger committed commitments of seeking this thank you Thank you very much, Sagneet, for that uh, complex reading of Rakhil Dash Bandyapadhyay's, um, you know, professional and imaginary world. I invite Shreyasi Shreyasi Paul to present um, her. Shreyasi is presently assistant professor at Amity University, Kolkata. Her research interest in colonial societies, indigenous production. and state formation that's the range of the work that she does she has worked on english east india company and indian salt peter as her ample dissertation under the uh, supervision of professor koshay croy at jadavpur university um, and part of her thesis um, english east india company and indian salt peter a study in 18th and 19th century was presented at the Na- uh, nehru memorial museum and library in the young researchers workshop uh, she has presented at many other uh, forums as well uh, including um, at iit guwahati she has also spoken at samagam conference in 2017 on the british uh, fetish of salt peter and she has also published uh, at you know various places uh so with that sh- brief uh, introduction there's much more actually over here but i will for you know sake of sort of sticking to time uh, now invite shreshi paul to make a presentation thank you ma'am thank you uh, professor i'm so uh, i think i'm audible um, yes uh, yes so thank you professor and shumal bhotra and i take this opportunity to thank the organizers over here and also uh, professor stu um my uh, paper is titled as in clock and dagger reading an agro military production in 19th century india and uh, this paper primarily tries to review the representation of indic saw peter in british official consultations and narratives um in doing so it engages with the broader narrative uh, that perceives this epistemological pursuit in light of repositories of sovereign ideals that in order to comprehend and rationalize a new world such as india the british entered into the practice of gathering information armed with their pedagogical uh, tools there there was a widespread agreement that the society alike others could be known and represented as a series of facts the form of these facts were taken to be self evident of the administrative power the power of its calculations lies in its ability to divide of course to rationalize basically uh, but it is precisely through this analytic fragmentation that it loses sight of what it claims to seek and represent and as this paper essentially argues that contrary to their objective Uh, which which is usually that they were the repositories of the sovereign ideals uh, self evidentiary these narratives exposed the inherent vulnerability of the state's sovereign order um in doing so in this context this paper is looking into the intellectual pursuit of h t colebrook one of the earliest account of the bengal producers um and it also sees that how the anxiety is embedded um in this uh, in this particular text which shows the myopia adhered to the intrinsic myopia adhered to the statist vision 
H.J. Colebrook, to tie, titled The Remarks on the Husbandry and the Agricultural Commerce of Bengal, was an earliest administrative account that represented a graphical and literary image of resources yielded by the assumed provinces of Eastern region. The commercial prospect for the British nation, as underlined by Colebrook, stood on the firm principle of the state's ability to exert complete control over the various productive units of the region. From this vantage point, Colebrook advocated the monopoly asserted by the company state over saltwater production to be integral to the progress of British commercial enterprise. The monopoly rights over saltwater production, according to Colebrook, was conducive to English gunpowder manufacturers who sought to make England the hub of gunpowder. Demands such as this served both military ambitions of early modern England and commercial aspirations of its brooding traders. Owing to this, the treatises of Colebrook was an important contribution to the body of information that rationalized the state's exclusive privilege over solpida production. Yet, as this paper seeks to argue that yet contrary to the asserted claims over state rights over manufacturing units, the disability of the state control over its production was simultaneously mentioned in his accounts. According to his information, which he encountered in the process of his gathering the information, um, varieties of unrefined salt obtained in the process of potassium nitrate, that is basically saltpeter, production were known as khari namak, traditionally mixed with the fodder by the Indian communities to feed their cattle. The quotidian nature of this praxi in terms of Colebrook was a customary practice that violated state's authority. The author's myopic vision was the product of his European perception, as I want to argue over here, towards this article. Saltpeter's unitary association with the gunpowder was solely responsible for this kind of vision. Under these circumstances, the diverse usages as existed within indigenous society were marked as a threat to state's establishment. Colebrook, even though took cognition of the multiple usages of saltpeter by the local agricultural community, termed it illegal. And I have also pointed out that Jagadish Narayan Chalkar, a modern day historian, is one of the only uh, historians who have located Indian saltpeter in the pre European days and have pointed out that various diverse multiple uses, usages of saltpeter uh, as it existed in the indigenous community. But of course, we do not find that particular account in Colebrook's uh, narrative. What we see is that Colebrook's adherence to European notions deprived his vision to situate manufacture, uh, manufactured very a very variety of nitrous salt as a part of indivisible indigenous communal assemblage. This conscripted outlook nevertheless enabled Colebrook to interpret it as a menace for the controlling authority of the colonial state. Official consultations dated back to 1770s echoed Colebrook's concern in this respect. The prevalence of clandestine production of night salt, as mentioned in these accounts, incapacitated the state to exercise its sovereign control over the manufacturing units. But this discourse in their process of generating the idea of sovereign presence of the state owing to its syntactic nature manifested the inherent inability of the administration to control and supervise all segments of the indigenous society. Primarily, the dialectic intrinsic to this class of literature was the outcome of a commercial perspective. As I have noted it down that um, in the words uh, of Matthew L. Edney, these canonical works produced to aid administrative apparatus projected and represented the territories from a narrow objectified vision. Uh, were actually responsible that the, uh, you know, that left a permanent note of friction for the manifestation of the British sovereign authority. Uh, over the subcontinent. A similar pattern can be seen while interrogating the works of Francis Buchanan, as I have taken this particular case study. Francis Buchanan's account uh, goes back to the first half of 19th century, and it's a very dominant account when we talk about, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, colonial uh, narratives. And Francis Buchanan, whose account was authorized by the company state by the early decades of 19th century, uh, has assessed and collected information regarding the actual yield of territories. He himself has boasted that because of he has deployed the rational scientific methods uh, inspired by the lineage methods of classification. And therefore, he himself was a student of medicine. And in his accounts of 1809 to 1810, 
uh, following the paradigm set by Colebrook in respect to Indian saltpeter, he sketched a near similar condition regarding the saltpeter production. His observations in Purnia in regard to saltpeter production as encountered took cognizance of the community assemblage that constituted both the cultivator's household and its cattle as an indivisible factor for the availability of unrefined natural nitro salt in the province. Yet, Buchanan, following the predominant administrative narrative, perceived it as a major source of clandestine trade conducted as a norm by the local community. He argued and and he furthermore argued that the agricultural assemblage, which is intrinsic to this process, um, was absolutely ignored by him. And as a preventive measure to stop the illegal proxy, Buchanan has said that he urged the state to create a common pasture land for cattle where all of them could be gathered and, uh, and grazed and therefore saltpeter could be collected. In the words of James Scott, um, who sees any kind of development aimed, of, aimed at uniformity or uh, uniformity stood congruent to the increasing extension of state's authority over its subject. And I really find that by 19th century, as I was going through Buchanan's account, that I really find that Buchanan's solution uh, in order to, uh, you know, to supervise, to extend the supervision of the, uh, of the state over the saltpeter producing region has echoed the same concern. Uh, although Buchanan viewed the implementation of these measures of common pasture ground uh, would end infringement of the state in private lives of the manufacturing community, besides being an effective measure accommodating the segregated individual productive household units under the roof of administrative purview. Ironically, uh, modern historians like N. K. Sinha uh, and later Shobushachi Bhattacharya, Omyoke Bakchi, Irfan Habib, Alexander Chicharov, and also uh, revisionist scholars, the new imperialist scholars like ben Br Brenda J. Buchanan, James D. Tracy, David Tracy, in similar vein finds that the British penetration over these units have been uh, hegemonic. And, and it was primarily the complete control over saltpeter production units that made Britain um, the, the global power by the 19th century. And yet, as I argue, that Buchanan's own admission can be ascertained in this regard, who sees an un, where we find an undaunted concern solely surrounding the idea of communal indulgence towards saltpeter smuggling. And according to him, uh, it was the poor payment. Um, furthermore, I, uh, furthermore, the anxiety that is self evidentiary in these accounts can be seen in the accounts of Montgomery Martin, which comes out, which has been published by the 1839 onwards. The administrative discourse throughout 19th century indicates state's concern over the illicit production of unrefined saltpeter and its street. Even the accounts of Montgomery Martin are especially significant in this regard. By 1839, Martin voiced similar concerns as his predecessors did. By 20th century, LSS O'Malley, in a series of Bengal District Gazetteer, mentioned the prevalent practice of saltpeter trade that were conducted beyond the purview of the Crown's administration. Why I am using this particular two, uh, two of these texts? Because I really find a, a, a syntactic uh, or a systematic continuation of the narratives that uh, that represents saltpeter and the the communal uh, production of saltpeter in this regard which sees that the state is still failing to control the various units um, of saltpeter production by that time the british state boasted a uniform management of saltpeter production that is by 20th century um, mostly under the supervision of northwestern salt department Nevertheless, this narrative simultaneously recorded the persistent shortfall of the British authority to exert its control over all means that were engaged in saltpeter manufacture and trade. By 20th century, with the progress of agricultural scientific pursuit, Indian saltpeter underwent a redefining stage. It was in this period the British state accepted the utility of saltpeter not only on the basis of saltpeter, not only the basis of gunpowder, but also as a significant chemical for manure. And why I point it to be important because by 20th century, uh, it was back in Europe that there was um, a new dogmas were reinvented uh, invented in regard to saltpeter that sees where 
the focus of a salt saltpeter by that time has shifted from from its usage as a gunpowder material to how it can be used as a manure and it is simultaneously we see that this kind of revision this kind of um, uh, you know, uh, this kind of statements regarding saltpeter, the, the shift in state's perspective towards Indian saltpeter can be seen back in the, uh, uh, in the colony of, uh, of India. Burton Stein, in the introduction of agrarian policies, argued that since the initial phase, the modern historical pursuit in regard to India's past was dominated by the study of agriculture. Yet, this discursive entities fell short to locate saltpeter units uh, in its broader indigenous social assemblage as a part of everyday life in its various refined and unrefined states. Seeing through tainted European perspective, um, these consultations or these narratives, these official narratives uh, and, and the literature that were produced uh, thrived to represent and rationalize the sovereign authority of the British state in India. Correspondingly, it was this alien trajectory that acted as an impediment and restricted British state to perceive the actual indigenous society and its praxis. The parochial dogmas constructed throughout the British administration therefore projected such image of the subcontinent, um, especially in regard to saltpeter production, that remained as a constant threat to its sovereign order. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, Rayashi, for that uh, presentation. Uh, I think I have to cede ground here to Shubhatri, right? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so yeah, so uh, we can have uh, Yulian's comments and then comments from you, and then eventually I'll open it up for uh, questions from the audience. All yours, all yours. Sure, I'll, I'll shoot. Um, well, this is my, my personal take that highlights subjective points of interest. And I'll also pose some questions that by no means need to structure the discussion that follows, but that may be picked up by you if you think that makes sense. Uh, so to begin with the first paper, the way I saw it, uh, it approached its subject from two angles. Uh, first, the disciplining and controlling of sexuality and gender through colonial and post-colonial governmental institutions. And second, the role of archives within these dynamics. You pertinently highlight how sexual binaries and fixed biological criteria emerged under circumstances of colonialism, only to be perpetuated up to the present day. And you also demonstrate how sexuality is not simply a personal matter, but enmeshed in politics of gender, caste, religion, class, and so on. Since you had to present your material in a short time, I would be interested in knowing more about how you approach the question of archives from a more theoretical and methodological angle. You described your aim as a decentering of the notion that the colonial archives of India constitute a sovereign institution functioning as evidentiary mechanisms of historical fact checking. That's a quote. And uh, you subscribe to the argument that we should also understand as an archive any corpus of selective collections and the longings for the acquisitive guests for the primary, originary, and the untouched entail. So I wonder what kinds of concrete sources should then be considered as part of an archive and how we as scholars can approach these sources. I'm completely convinced by your critical perspective on archives in the con conventional sense, as you put it. And I agree that it would be misleading to view archives as a, a neutral locus of knowledge as they are themselves part of governmental and hence obviously power related structures. So it would be great to know a bit more about how you approach alternative archives. Uh, I understood that you regard responses to sexual politics, for instance, documented in the internet uh, as important archives. And could you elaborate a bit on how you contrast such sources with the state controlled, heavily localized and structured archives? How can we work with them in, in practice? And can they be understood as, as more pure or more direct than conventional archives? So 
the uh, now to the sovereignty on trial paper, which was another really great paper. I, I enjoyed all of them a lot. It is great to have these different perspectives on basically similar issues. So the, the second uh, paper similarly highlighted the problem of how sources contained in archives are structured by governmental conditions and that those, uh, those sources were created and crucially also selected according to specific political interests, and then of course also preserved according to certain interests. In this case, a narrative of violence served both diplomatic purposes and the exertion of local authority, which is tied with in, uh, in with the administrative structuring of geographical space. In contrast, you point towards what you call transactions of social groups, uh, such as the sannyasis, the farmers, and the, the people involved with pastoral activities as agents in place making and structuring in their own right. There were in short complex social dynamics behind the administrative narrative of violence with uh, all its legal and manipulative intentions. So I would ask you to give us your thoughts on, on two aspects here, um, or perhaps on, on one aspect in particular. Uh, first, you, you said that an expansion of, your, of our focus, of our scholarly focus beyond the administrative narrative, and this is a quote, gives us the opportunity to argue the entangled histories of violence and commercial or sustenance exchanges prevalent in the, in the region, end of quote. And you raised the question if this was a quote, moment of autonomous history without king, in end of quote. And could you dwell a bit more on what you mean with that, especially with regard to the notion of sovereignty? So how does autonomous history relates to sovereignty and how was sovereignty claimed and practiced in light of your example, specifically in the absence of royalty, right? So third, uh, Shongik's paper opened up a wide variety of issues that would all demand extensive discussion in their own rights. And you, you concentrate on, on what you term a, a, a sovereign regime of truth that emerged within a tangle of like Western academic disciplines and local learning. You demonstrate that Rakaldash uh, Bandupadai decidedly uh, political projects, like his decidedly political project was shaped through Sanskrit and European archeological training with an intention to claim sovereignty over the Bengali past in order to define national identity in his present. It became clear that this project was conditioned by existing power relations. And as you said, Raghaldas uh, disseminated supposedly true knowledge of the past in the vernacular domain, which must be understood as a, a tactical maneuver against the structures of colonialism. So many fascinating aspects of that constellation are addressed by you, such as the synchronicity with the Puranic tradition, for instance, and its different conceptions of time and space, or epistemological questions of proof and, and truth and evidence and reality. You might also, uh, you also rightly pointed out a, a frequent ambiguity in such nationalist historical works of the period. Namely, that Rakaldash restricted historical agency to the Brahmanical domain of cultural Aryan, as you use the, the term of Shurupa Gupta here, and to the, the statesmen themselves. So, we are dealing, in fact, with a, a very typical focus on what you also really emphasized as the masculine space of the nation state, which further complicates the power dynamics that conditioned the work of a scholar like Rakaldash. And having worked on the Borendo and Shondan Shomiti and the Banaras Hindu University, I am particularly interested in these aspects, but I would like to focus on a more general question. Uh, so uh, I, I would uh, ask you to, to dwell a bit more on the notion of sovereign truth. Uh, in, in light of the tension between different epistemologies and colonial structures favoring specific modes of knowledge production. How do you conceptualize sovereignty here? Also with regard to the ambiguities of, of, of agency that you addressed. 
And finally, uh, thanks to the last presentation, we can also consider an economic dimension through the saltpeter production in the early colonial period, which was marked, as you showed very clearly, by a dis disjuncture between local usage of raw materials that significantly were essential for the expansion and maintenance of empire. It, it wasn't just some uh, material, like it was a material for warfare. You highlight a major problem of, of how historians have approached this issue based on canonical works representing a political uh, or politically and economically motivated and hence uh, and a specific narrow perspective on the production and use of saltpeter. These accounts have led many historians to conclude that the company's influence over local actors was ever expanding, while at the same time, there are multiple other accounts that demonstrate a variety of diverging uses of saltpeter beyond the company's control. In short, a, a number of scholars have neglected that local use of saltpeter in, in, in its various states as part of everyday life which directly results from European perspectives on the material itself, which then in turn manifested in written historical sources available to us. So we have a really great combination between materiality and, and social practices and written sources here. Against the background of the, the previous chapters, I uh, would ask you to discuss your take on sovereignty again in the context of local versus imperial agro-military production. How would you contrast local usage of saltpeter with the company's interests and at what points could locals resist those interests and thus claim sovereignty over their everyday lives or at least some aspects of them? What possibilities do we have to grasp the complexity of the historical situation that we can only assume while we have to work largely on the basis of colonial administrative sources. So in sum, all these intriguing papers have addressed crucial questions of practice and sovereignty. As you might have noticed, I, my overarching uh, questions are, how do we conceptualize practice and sovereignty to begin with? And how do we operate with them as scholars? How do we select and approach sources? These questions are obviously particularly pertinent given the colonial context in which our sources were created, selected and archived that is preserved, but also in a certain way preserved after having been structured. I'm looking forward to seeing how our contributors will shed the light on these issues and for now I will, I will shut up. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Malotra, do you want to come in with your comments or should we have first round of responses in the... Uh, that's totally up to you. You can have first round of responses. I don't have specific questions to the uh, speakers. I just want to sort of my overall comments on this panel. All right, what... so let us have first round of responses from the panelists since we're doing very good on time. Everyone has kept to time. So let's have first round of responses and then uh, you can come in and then we'll open it up for the audience. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Stroop, for your comments and, and, and the question. Uh, I think the way I would like to approach the uh, the question of archive is by you know by uh, by sort of questioning what constitutes the very you know very being or the domain of the archive, and uh, uh, with regard to the way I would want to deconstruct the colonial archives is through uh, locating uh, certain gender non-conforming and gender fluid identities within the archives. And uh, with, uh, with regard to this, I think uh, what uh, there, there is one uh, legislation uh, that, uh, uh, that is widely uh, spoken, of, spoken of by uh, the scholar called Anjali Arondekar. It's called the Queen Empress versus Khairati, and it's in 1884, uh, it, where a, a person named Khairati was convicted, was, uh, was arrested. Uh, on the suspicion that he had uh, committed, uh, you know, sodomy or homosexuality, and uh, the so Anjali Arundekar, what she does is she gives a very detailed reading of this particular case, and the way 
it has been constructed in the language within the archive is uh, is sort, sort of violative of the very body integrity of Khairati. So, for example, Khairati's very intimate details of Khairati's physical descriptions were given uh, in into this, uh, you know, in, in into this legislation, which kind of proves again that Khairati had indeed committed the crime of sodomy, which was uh, at that time prosecuted under Section 377. And uh, for me, I I think that it's this language of the archive, that the, the very dominating language of the archive that scholars have to be very aware of and how we construct the archive. So, uh, so for example, it, it reminds me of Antoine Edwarton's uh, work on, you know, home, the very space of the home uh, dwelling in the archive, the very space of the home as archive, the way we live inside a home, the artifacts and the entire architecture of the home as archives. Um, I would also like to bring here uh, Urvashi Butalia's work on the uh, on the partition violence of of uh, of uh, India about the the whole you know the it, the experiences of violence, the the the, narr the narratives that the oral histories that she talks about in her book. And how those also constitute, uh, you know, very important domain of uh, of not not just to put forward a very evi the the a very concrete or concrete evidence that such and such incidents had happened, but at the same time is also kind of reflective of the very experiences that are imbued within those archival spaces. Uh, the other thing that I would like to, uh, you know, like to push forward is the way archives, the way things are archived, the what is being archived currently, if I'm trying to broaden the boundaries of the very understanding of archive, and I'm, I'm really talking about the various responses in the contemporary times of trans and gender fluid communities uh, against uh, certain diktats of the state, it's also important for us to understand that there are certain voices which even within the process of the democratization of the archival space are not being considered. So, so there are, uh, I mean, I have been following a couple of trans uh, women who are doing some excellent work in the suburban areas of West Bengal in certain districts and they have been writing you know copious posts against facebook posts against the uh, the, the trans bill and the nalsa judgment and also uh, also the citizenship amendment act and all of these are not are, are not documented anywhere for public viewing it is to be shared with the people they are friends with. And I think that is one politics within the archive that we need to be really aware of as scholars that uh, while we do try to you know, broaden archival spaces, we also know that there will still be certain voices that will, and especially belonging to certain geocultural spaces, which are not the voices which are not dominated from the metropolitan cities that will still not be you know, considered as documents enough documents important enough to be archived i'm not sure if i have like correctly responded to your question but this is how i feel thank you Should i go ahead uh thank you dr Su, for the uh, feedback and your uh, uh, question uh, regarding the autonomous histories part. Uh, this is emanating from both the both how uh, Nepal has been construed, you know, in the post-colonial you know, nation state, and also how Purnia, which is an eastern boundary of the Beng erstwhile Bengal Suba, uh, has been you know documented as a military outpost. So something which is already been uh, you know uh, considered as a as an uh, you know archived as a military outpost, you have categories of you know uh, attacks and uh, violations of territorial order and uh, and uh, you know, uh, all sorts of dacoity and all these episodes. Uh, the fact remains here. Uh, what what should, what I argue here is, since the act, since the place of the act, the uh, the place where the act took place, is uh, is far removed, you know, from the you know, from the seat of power. And since I'm not looking at the frontier as a very rigid category also, 
uh, I'm arguing that these are uh, very transactional spaces that I already mentioned. Uh, I'm also looking at how these district uh, courts, you know, the, the thanas at different villages were also removed from the act of these, you know, uh, from the places, spaces of these acts. So here, uh, even the uh, uh, the Nepal king who is, uh, who is accused in the uh, documents of dispatches of sheltering the Fakirs and the sannyasis and the Dakots in his uh, is also uh, removed from these you know very internecine uh, uh, units of you know components of uh, such acts. So this is something I don't know. Like uh, I, I think I may be uh, falling short of answering your uh, question, but this is something I am looking at for removal from the site of the event itself. Uh, this is something I want to say. And uh, you talked about administrative structure. Uh, Punya is actually considered to be one of the first uh, places, one of the first districts to be the laboratories of all British experiments. You know, removal of the false that You have uh, George Dukerel, who was the first English governor to be placed. You have H.T. Colebrook also, who is placed in Purnia itself. So it showed how Purnia was always considered to be one of the most important uh, administrative units uh, in the uh, British uh, uh, discourse, if, uh, official uh, discourse, if I can call it. Uh, you have Buchanan also, who, whose Journal of Punya we have no access to, which is lost. But uh, these are the three, I think, uh, moments, if I can take from uh, William Van Schendel's, you know, uh, Chittagong in four moments, uh, when he looks at special assemblages. So these are the moments where, you know, these autonomies are created by the very act, which are far removed from the uh, very district and very localized units, which also suggests to us that there is a local uh, nexus and a very uh, localized grid of network that is in place. So that is what I would like to kind of, uh, uh, as a uh, response to your uh, question, if I don't know, like, uh, if I'm able to. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Julian, for for your comments and uh, and the and the question that you have raised uh, of the sovereign truth. Now, uh, this is something I'm still exploring, but uh, let me just uh, let me let me just try to at least you know uh, make an effort to understand you know what I mean by sovereignty of you know truth myself. What I'm trying to say is that for me, Rakhal Dash is always, I mean, there is no one space, uh, you know, even though we talk about epistemic rupture and, you know, it has been talked about by the likes of Shubhut Kukoviraj and all other scholars who have really worked, you know, for, for their lives you know, on, on these things. But uh, I think here it is still uh, a kind of a, confluence of a lot of, you know, uh, the kind of, you know, world order, if I can say, or life world, if I can say, together. And Rakhal Dash is situated, you know, amidst uh, all this. Yet, uh, he believes that uh, from his political vantage point, and he thinks that his history might remain, you know, off the politics and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, he's trying to purify these two domains time and again. And, uh, you know, uh, he's just trying to, you know, uh, sort out, classify this kind of, uh, this world, world views, you know, into separate domains of what is factual and what is fictional and so on. So what he's redrawing it time and again. So let me, let me just give, you know, one, one example maybe uh, in, in this. And he, he blames his failures to, you know, either the lack of the sources, or the because he said that you know it's only the skeleton you know skeletal history that is there, and one of the you know fine example is that when he's talking about the Aryanization of Bengal, uh, the the previous part of you know advent of the Aryans he's finishing the, uh, he uh, the, uh, know, the chapter of Aryanization in Bengal he's saying that you know the last part that we do not have the substantial proof to say that uh, the Aryans did ad, you know uh, conquered Bengal and you know, cultured them into their own ways. But we heard the name of Bijoy Shingho. And if it is correct, then Bijoy Shingho's name uh, is not a non-Aryan name, it's an Aryan name. So we can, you know, suppose that, you know, uh, the Aryan occupation of the land was complete. 
And in the next chapter, the very next chapter in his Bangla Ritya, she said that, uh, so even though Mogod and Bengal was you know, occupied by the Aryans, uh, 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 the non-Aryan communities you know, kept on living in the land and they you know, adopted to the Aryan way of living and dharma and all that. So what I'm trying to say is that here, he, he is always very you know, torn between the idea of, uh, of his politics in, in one sense of how he wants to you know, project his you know, uh, you know, vision of history. And also the the facticity of whatever he's get, getting, you know, Kafure Praman that that you know Horopushak Chakti calls it, written in stone, uh, in something like that. And uh, I think uh, his sovereign truth is something that he is imagining in this world for himself. Where and he thinks it's extremely important, you know, for 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 the as a foundation of a of a nation state, because otherwise he thinks that. Any falsehood or any you know app, you know any any kind of diversion from the truth in itself will result into some other civilizational problem, which he sees as you know, as the process of the progress and the decline of the community. What he has this hindsight of you know how we have already declined, and he he really wants to go back and you know try to find out you know all the other uh, all all these kind of you know ideas of. Uh, you know, uh, anecdotes and ideas of truth and trying to create his own world where he cannot be challenged. And it is not, I mean, even though it is highly, you know, uh, influenced by, let's say, Western epistemic uh, authority, I think he has also translated this entire authority in his own way. So the sovereignty does not only lie from the top down uh, assimilation of the uh, episteme. Rather, it is also the translation of the episteme and how he pursues it into, you know, you know, into the all other domains of his, you know, uh, academic and uh, political activity is something that I really want to take a look at. And I think that the question of sovereignty uh, of truth lies somewhere there. I know it's, uh, I think it, 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 it is a messy answer, but I, I hope that I, I will reach somewhere maybe, you know, reading it. Uh, more on this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Strobe, Strobe uh, for for your question. Actually, it is really insightful for me um, uh, to to pursue it further. Um, as your, uh, I really see, um, you know, uh, the sovereignty of uh, uh, the the discourse of sovereignty, which the colonial administration tried to proceed. Uh, you know, it is a contention of the commodity and the anti-commodity. Uh, that is a very interesting aspect because commodity is something that they, uh, uh, the, the saltpeter at its refined state, which is a commodity for the empire, of course, not only, uh, not only for the business purpose, commercial purpose, but of course, the defense is attached to it. And the anti-commodity, that is, that is privilege, that is something which is there, which is a commute, which is, which, is, which is an indivisible part of the community, indigenous community, that have been, uh, you know, absolutely, they know, they were very well aware of the fact that they cannot, uh, you know, uh, it is there, produced in every household, which have been collected by a certain quote unquote, uh, cast by the Nunias, and then have been refined under the factories. But of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the contention between the commodity and the anti-commodity and the commodity on which the British administration tried to exert its sovereign order, which they thought that they will uh, exert a complete control over that. I think the contention lies there. Saying that, I also want to point out over here that in the indigenous community, it was not only uh, that the uh, that the manure or uh, the medicinal usages of these saltpeter that was you know in, in its unrefined state, but we also see that the firecrackers, which is an inevitable uh, part of uh, almost of all the societies, you know, the firecrackers and the knowledge of producing the firecrackers, which has existed even when uh, saltpeter in its refined state has been, uh, you know, uh, has been uh, asserted as a commodity, it's a very important commodity by the state, both by the company state and by the English crown, uh, by the crown state. Uh, so I really find that uh, 
the idea of sovereignty is 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 revolving around that that what they consider to be a commodity and what they consider to be an anti commodity in this case we are still being and most of the scholars are still uh, perceiving that idea that it is all about the commodity the saltpeter in its refined state and we are absolutely we are still following that particular narrative and we are absolutely ignorant of the fact that uh, there are certain other usages not only manure not only that but also firecrackers which is which is evidential which is which is which we still uh, you know which is there in our everyday life in everyday uh, uh, festivities um, um, so i think uh, maybe uh, this is a very very crude answer to your uh, very insightful question and uh, thank you professor malutra can we can we have your set of comments and then i think we have one question from the audience i'll just um, unmute our speaker whilst you comment yeah okay thank you so much um, again shubhatri for uh, inviting me to do this and thank you so much for all these wonderful presentations uh, that we've heard this morning and that i had the pleasure of reading beforehand uh, and for uh, dr strubs uh, comments and his you know questions to the uh, speakers i'm going to sort of kind of tie up the four papers in the way that i uh, imagined and sort of tie it up with the overarching themes of this conference on you know issues of sovereignty of the archive of practice and so on so here goes so how the question uh, of sovereignty or questions of sov uh, sovereignty emerge in all these four papers establishing of supreme control in some ways over the indian subcontinent Uh, and of course a pushback you know that shashi for example has you know uh, underlined in her paper but the desire to control the subcontinent its land its people its animals its resources and its pasts in some senses uh, this was a slow and incremental process for the east india company and one dependent on slow accumulation of knowledge defining what composed knowledge and thus building the archive as a very foundation of the project of colonialism and i would say eventually of you know making the empire uh, that this process was highly selective as all the you know papers have highlighted over here in that what mattered and what could be thrown by the wayside uh, and this included the people right who would be the collaborators and help create the repositories of a specific order of knowledge allowing for the evolution of specific specific forms of governmentality right and who would not be a part of this now starting with salt peter that shreshi has brought up gunpowder which was the very heart of the project of the ongoing contest over sovereignty right uh, throughout the early modern period as she pointed out england was dependent upon imports uh, i think from germany and other such places uh, with monopolizing of indian resources as david cressy's work that shreshi also pointed out uh, his work on salt peter has shown setting for a uh, setting for not only indian but global dom so you know the the control over salt peter that allowed for uh, england to dominate not only india but you know position itself as a globally dominant power is something that we need to underline as we know commercial boats that the dutch created uh, and they bestowed upon the world the bigger and you know more commodities that they could carry uh, moved with the gunboats right and so violence in its naked and brutal form uh, becomes more accessible to the british thanks to you know control over india now this these various forms of violence remind me of you know the recent uh, writings of someone like kim wagner whether we look at look at his work on thuggi on 1857 on jallianwala bag uh, <clears throat> or um, his work or uh, you know very very fascinating work called the skull of alam beg uh, the use of spectacular performative violence uh, and as you know ashish's paper also demonstrates that what happens in purnia or morang uh, 
how you know this acts directly on people on their ways of life this violence which is endemic which is ubiquitous right and it created its own grisly archive as well as you know wagner shows through mementos and trophy skulls that uh, begin to circulate in uh, the world of the colonials uh, whether in india in africa south america or china um, that the colonials collected and here is an archive outside of a building right um, you know that uh, i think uh, isaria's yeah. work started to think what is the archive right and it's clearly way beyond uh, a building uh, the object here becoming a thing uh, on mantelpieces and decorative showcases and writing desks in global circulation and underscoring absolute power and of course skulls always remind you of joseph conrad's uh, the heart of darkness uh, which is both a critique of the brutal colonization uh, of uh, congo by this tiny little you know belgian state uh, but is also complicit in in that process of colonization right Uh, now from the spectacular violence to more endemic everyday violence violence that denies life in diverse forms uh looking at queer subjectivities that isaria does uh looking at unruly bodies violence bodies that refuse categorization into tropes of masculinity and femininity being rewritten uh which refuse to conform right and i'm so glad that i saw a sort of highlighted jessica hinchy's work uh on the hijra unique and other communities and other bodies uh that were sought to be tamed corralled confined and criminalized through the criminal tribes act of 1871 or the article 377 of the criminal uh penal code and its recent histories and that you know she so wonderfully pointed out to 2014 with definition of trans people and 2018 when 377 is decriminalized in 2019 where a right to self perceived gender hobbled through registration of the criminal tribes act that you know i said i points out to she also points out to the fishers within the queer identities movement based on caste class and you know gender identification so this is a bulky archive of repression then that we are all uh, dealing with uh and how do we proceed for a more affirmative politics for the histo- for for everyone but also for the historian right uh and hinchy's work on the khwaja sarai again that you uh, pointed to recuperate uh different understandings of eunuchs and the role that they play in society uh in avadh court for example uh you know that she points out in one of her articles uh and albeit their weakening role uh, historically speaking a very important one or in in terms of global histories if you can think about the role of gazanfar in 17th century politics of uh, the ottoman empire a person who was venetian male christian uh and becomes a eunuch muslim and very powerful so you know there are diverse histories and we need to in a sense recuperate these histories and it reminds me and i i want to point isaria towards the work of saidia hartman uh, and her method of critical um uh, fabulation of retrieving the fragments and sometimes extending historical presence through imagination so i think what you know a work like that of hartman is doing is it's it's actually uh, pushing the envelope also on what the historian can do right so if you have only fragments of of lives that are available to us what do we do with these fragments and can we in fact use um imagination right to to stretch the boundaries of what is even accepted as historical right so i think you know there is something fabulous that you could uh do with that as she does as hartman herself does with young black girls lives who migrated uh from uh, american south during the jim crow laws to a life that they thought they would look forward to in philadelphia but a life that was so circumscribed but a retrieval of that 
recuperation of that life uh, that you know uh, Hartman does so brilliantly. Um, and of course, also this contemporary moment in India, the threat of the creation of an archive of national citizens that we are all, you know, under the shadow of, right? Uh, bodies that can be incorporated and those who must be excluded. So, you know, new logics of power that are there. Once again, clarifying the relationship of the archive and power for us, right? Uh, and here we are, you know, as Anne Stoller said, we are reading along the grain. We don't always have to read against the grain. We can read along the grave, a grain to see how structures of power are created. Uh, and this, of course, reveals the logics of governmentality. Um, and finally, you know, Rakhal Das um, um, how he juxtaposes, as Sagnik shows, uh, scientism and imaginary regimes of truth uh, and static ocular centric observation uh, and kalpana, right? The archeologist and the Sanskritist, uh, the, you know, discoverer of Mohanjadaro and the nationalist historical fiction that he writes. Um, and one can, as, as, as Sagnik has done, uh, he invokes Bankim Chattopadhyay, but one can in Punjab also invoke someone like Bhai Veer Singh who does something fairly similar, and where Aryavarta itself is fabricated in some sense, and I do use the term fabricated uh, very, with, with great care. Uh, so both the thrill of civilizational achievement wedded with Orientalist vision and overcoming the inadequacy of the present moment, right? Because it is through this, this feeling of inadequacy that you know, this, this quest starts. Uh, pinning that in inadequacy to the, to the medieval period of Indian history, to Muslim invasions, Muslim invasions and the centuries of foreign rule, right? Uh, resonates with our present moment, of course. Recent work of uh, Manan Ahmad Asif, for example, the loss of Hindustan and the invention of India, uh, how we have come to rely on the colonial archive and its design, right? Colonialism refuses to the colonized, uh, as uh, Manan says, uh, access to their own past, right? And superimposes the present over the past such that all conveniences and prejudices of the present obliterate the complexities and the lived realities of the past, right? Uh, and in some ways, you know, Rakhal uh, imaginative project uh, is, is resonant today in some ways, you know, what you write about his uh, novel Dharmapal, uh, historical fiction, you know, uh, is resonant today. So the present moment, uh, the rhetoric of nationalism, uh, its archive of repression, fashioning a new toxic masculinity, right? That others, even as it seeks incorporation of women, of Dalits, of you know, queer identities of Muslims. And I think it is very important. It's the job of the historian in some ways to say, how did we reach here, right? To investigate that. And also how do we move out of this hole we seem to have dug ourselves into? But I will, you know, sort of uh, finish with uh, a more positive note. Uh, invoking Michel de Certeau's evocation of the everyday acts of subversion and negotiation, uh, opportunism and dodging, the tactics of survival when regimes strategize repression, the expression of non-compliance are important to challenge, you know, a homogenizing sovereignty, right? Uh, and so practice there becomes very, very significant. Uh, sovereignty in modern regimes based apparently on the will of the people uh, is monochromatic today, right? Understanding of the will. It's a very monochromatic understanding of the will and we need to push beyond it. Challenge the given canonicity of the archive of power and in some senses embrace the fragmented, the marginalized, the liminal and the alternative uh, archives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Manatra. Those were uh, very insightful comments. And um, 
we don't have time for responses as of now because we have one question from the audience. Um, Dr. Milindo Banerjee, uh, his own work on sovereignty in, in colonial Bengal is of course uh, very fascinating. And um, yeah, can we hear from you Milindo, the question? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Shubhatri. I really enjoyed um, every paper in the conference, but my specific question was uh, to Shagni. Uh, thank you for an absolutely fascinating paper. My question is, do you see any difference and transition from Bonkim Chandra to Rakhaldash? Bonkim also had his homogenizing, sanskritizing impulses, but still in the ending of a novel like Shitaram, we find subaltern lower caste characters radically questioning elite power and recorded history by putting into question the veracity of statist historical record. And I'm, I'm also drawing obviously on Yulian's wonderful comments about uh, complexifying notions of archives and Professor Malhotra's very important comment about the intrinsic fundamental relation between archive and violence. And uh, Professor Malhotra mentioned a lot of really interesting sources. What came to my mind immediately was, of course, Ronajit Goho's The Prose of Counterinsurgency, how archival language is essentially the language of, of colonial violence. So in, in reaction to all of this, uh, uh, my question is, do we see uh, such an impulse, an unhappy consciousness about historical archives, to borrow Shurikta Kobiraj's Hegelian expression, disappearing in Rakhaldash? And how would you see Robindranath's positionality in all of this? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Milinuga, uh, for this question. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so for me, uh, whether uh, I... So Bonkim is basically, and we all that we have, you know, read uh, uh, the texts on this kind, you know, this complexity of you know, nationalist history, the, the you know, beginning of the nationalist history writing as a, or the historiographical operation of you know, nationalism in, in one sense. We see that there was this, you know, call that has been given like what I have also mentioned uh, here. And, uh, but with Bunkin, the yardsticks where I think I feel somewhere down the line is still not drawn the way that Akhal Dash has drawn his own you know uh, yardsticks for what should be you know history history what a historiographical operation should uh, uh, in a sense that uh, you have rightly mentioned that you know, there are voices still available in the in the uh, in the novels that where they are challenging this you know ideas of you know statist uh, uh, way of looking at past and so on and so forth but uh, with Rakhal Das somehow, even in his uh, novels, uh, not only in his factual history, which is so, you know, uh, even Shuniti Kumar Chattopadhyay, you know, uh, told about it's a Nirosh Itihash, what he Rakhal Das writes, and in there is there is no uh, so-called, you know, possibility of uh, uh, beyond the proof, right? But that is not the case if we go deeper. But then uh, I would come back to the novel you know, uh, you know, writing of Rahal Das Bandhavata, even there, we see that uh, he is only, and he is, you know, making this jump in time uh, also in the, while he is looking at the event. So for him, even in that domain, when he is trying to create a kind of rather popularized uh, history of Bengal and, you know, unbridling his own politics into it, you know, much more than what he feels that he can do in the domain of, academic history writing, professional history writing, he is opening up uh, and he's making this time jump rather than talking and delving into the, you know, the contemporary society and how he has imagined it. But the whole point is that even because he had not done this, uh, Rakhal Dash had not done this, we have to see that what he does mean by public, what he does mean by, you know, the, the society per se. And that remains extremely constricted in the upper equivalent of the society. And so, so for me, and he's quite, rather quite unapologetic about it. He thinks that the history and uh, the prime example of this is that he's saying that uh, not only Japanese nationalism, I don't think only the fondness towards the Japanese nationalistic in a, in a growth, uh, which you have in your book, The Mortal God mentioned quite extensively about, but, uh, uh, not only that, but his very idea that the history and the you know uh, the the you know the sentinel being the sentinel of the culture, it is only in the elite section of the society who will and the masculine you know uh, uh, elite section of the society will hold the you know custodianship to the past, and that is that is what he believes, and and that reflects in his novel as well. 
where it's only the elite section who are the prime movers. And he is largely influenced by Bonke, but he never really understood uh, what Bonke maybe tried to say uh, when he's saying that Bangali Itihas ke likhide, right? And when this is happening, uh, we can see Akhoi Kumar Moitro, a contemporary to uh, Rakhal Das Bandhapadhyay, Ramesh Chandra Mujumdar, a contemporary to Rakhal Das Bandhapadhyay, even Nihar Ranjan Rai, who are also critiquing Rakhal Das for doing something better or you know, doing something less with his own you know, sense of history writing. Nihar Ranjan being one of the critics. He's, he's also saying that I'm, you know, I'm actually you know, uh, responding to the call that Bunkim has given us as a community to write our own history. So the definition of history for Bunkim still remain ambiguous for the you know, later generations to come. And Bunkim also, I think, I don't know. I mean, I am to talk about Bunkim, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm very nervous when I'm talking about this, but this is my hypothesis, let's say. Uh, I think Bonkin has not really drawn the line of what, I mean, not in the way of, you know, academic practice in that sense uh, of how to do a history. He does, I mean, yes, there should be a coherent, you know, uh, evidentiary history that he may look at, but then this professionalization of history is something that I don't think Bonkin had, you know, tried to put forward, you know, all the more. But Rakhal does thinks that, you know, this professionalization of history is important to respond to the call of what Bonkim, you know, has given, and uh, and then he's trying to, you know, you know, work with the possibilities in the domain of the novel, and there also he's he still remained the prisoner of his own, you know, ideas of, you know, uh, sovereign uh -huh. practicity. Shagni, sorry to come in, but uh, yeah. we absolutely have to stop now. It's, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. And about yeah. the, I, I'm just finished with the Robindranath again, and another domain that I really should not dare to talk about, but Robindranath brought the historicality into the you know much more larger framework than the historic city in the practicity in that sense. And I think Robindranath in this in this sense stands quite opposite to Rakhal Dash, you know, in the, in his own imagination of how a past should be past of a community should be conceived. And in 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 that way, that's I'm I'm sorry. Thank I mean, it's a, no no no. That's okay. Thank you. I just want to take this opportunity to once again uh, thank Professor Malhotra, Yulian for joining us and all the panelists for very fascinating presentations and great questions from the audience. Thank you. And I hope some of you will join us for the rest of the panels. Thank you so much. Thank for this you. Opportunity.